Dear students, in this lesson we are going to complete the uh, circulation uh, physiology and we will carry on with the respiratory physiology. Um, now we are going to look at the cardiac cycle. Cardiac cycle is the sequence of events as blood enters the atria, leaves the ventricles and then starts over again. Synchronizing this is the intrinsic electrical conduction system. Influencing the rate is done by the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomous nervous system. Let's take a look at the uh, electrical conduction pathway. It is initiated by the sinoatrial node the sinoatrial node, or in short, we say the SA node, which is myogenic at 70 and 80 action potentials per minute, which means it beats or it produces impulses, 70 to 80 beats uh, impulses per minute. The depolarization is spread through the atria via gut junctions and internodal pathways to the atrioventricular node, or in short, we say the AV node. Spread of action potentials, uh, so, sorry, the fibrous connective tissue matrix of the heart prevents further spread of action potentials to the ventricles. So the impulse is hold a little bit for a short time at the AV node. The, this slight delay at, v, uh, at the AV node occurs due to slower formation of action potentials and allows further emptying of the atria. During this time, during this whole short period of the impulse before passing into the ventricles, gives the chance to the atria to complete their contraction and push the blood inside them into the ventricles to completely fill the ventricles for the ventricular cycle. The action potentials travel down the atrioventricular bundle, which is called the bundle of His, which splits into left and right atri atrioventricular bundles. They're the bundle branches. And then into the conduction myofibers, which are called the Purkinje cells. Electrical Conduction pathway, uh, in electric conduction pathway, action potentials travel down the atrioventricular bundle, bundle of His, which splits into left and right atrioventricular bundles, and then into the conduction myofibers, the Purkinje lives, uh, cells, and Purkinje cells are larger in diameter and conduct impulse very rapidly. That's why uh, the both ventricles, the right and the left ventricles, contract almost instantaneously without any delay. So uh, this causes the cells at the apex to contract nearly simultaneously, and this is for uh, this is very good for the uh, ventricular ejection. So had it not been that the ventricles were um, contracting at uh, at at a um, almost instantaneously and uh, they should con if they sh were to contract uh, consecutively then the global drive force of the heart could not have been achieved to meet the uh, necessaries to meet the demands of the uh, body cells now if we look at this um, figure here um, there are two vena cava entering the right atrium. This is the right atrium here. The first one is the superior vena cava, which brings the blood of uh, the head and neck region uh, to, to the uh, right atrium. And there is one coming, we don't see it here, one coming from the inferior part of the right atrium, and it enters the right atrium uh, coming from the torso, from the body, 
uh, which is called the inferior vena cava. And the sinoatrial node, or the SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart, generates impulses uh, here. It's at the uh, conjunction point of the superior vena cava to the right atrium. Then uh, the produced impulse passes through the atrial wall in, through both atria and comes to the atrioventricular node here. As you can see, a small dot at the junction of the um, uh, ventricular wall, the ventricular septum, um, connecting the atria and the ventricles. So this uh, impulse is held short at the uh, atrioventricular junction in order to um, give the atria time to push the blood in them into the ventricles so the ventricles are filled with blood enough uh, to be pushed into the aorta when they contract uh, to form the uh, blood pressure and to push blood to the um, cells of our body for the nutrients and oxygen and uh, as um, the ventricles are filled with blood by the contraction of the atria, then the uh, atrioventricular node releases the impulse and it passes through the um, his bundle, which then divides into two his bundles uh, alongside the uh, septum, interventricular septum, and then to Purkinje cells to contract both ventricles almost at the same time to, in order to be able to push the blood into the aorta. The electrical system gives rise to electrical changes, uh, which is named as the depolarization and repolarization, that is transmitted through isotonic body fluids, and this passage of uh, this uh, event of depolarization and repolarization is recordable from outside of the body. And this phenomenon is called the electrocardiography. So the work that we do to record the electrical impulses of uh, the uh, heart is called electrocardiography. And at the end, when the uh, electrical impulses are plotted on a um, graphical paper uh, and we get an uh, uh, output uh, from the uh, electrocardiograph, the uh, paper that we have in hand is named as the electrocardiogram. Now, as the sinoatrial node uh, generates an impulse and it travels through the atria towards the atrioventricular node here, the uh, contraction of the uh, atria produces a deflection in the electrocardiograph, which is named as the P wave. So, in an electrocardiogram, in, in a graphical paper like this, the P wave represents for the contraction or depolarization of the atria. And the pulse is held a little bit here at the atrioventricular node, which forms the PR segment. So once the atria are contracted, then the uh, electrical impulse is held a little bit at the atrioventricular junction. This, as time goes by, this is recorded as the uh, PR period in the uh, uh, ECG, electrocardiogram. And then uh, the impulse passes to the uh, septum and the uh, contraction of the septum begins, which is reflected makes a negative deflection in the um, uh, electrocardiogram as the Q wave. And as 
the septum depolarizes and starts to depolarize the whole myocardium. This is uh, recorded as the R wave as the septum goes downward. It's it gives a reflection deflection of a positive deflection, which is called the R wave. And as the rest of the septum depolarizes, it gives out the uh, S wave. So the QRS wave is the depolarization of the septum apex and the rest of the ventricle um, in the electrocardiogram. And as the um, contraction ends, the muscle starts to relax the ventricular muscle starts to relax, then we get a repolarization wave on the uh, electric cardiogram, which is called the T wave. So a PQRS waves are the waves for depolarization, and the T wave is the wave which indicates to repolarization. You can see that uh, we have a repolarization wave here for the ventricles. The, that means that the um, uh, cardiac muscle is relaxing, but we cannot see a repolarization wave of the atria, which contracted here. So the repolarization or the relaxation of the atria is somewhere in the contraction period of the polarization period of the ventricles and because ventricles cause a more dominant more high voltage um, wave on the ECG we cannot see the relaxation um, wave of the atria so contraction of atria contraction of the ventricles and relaxation of the ventricles can be recorded but the relaxation wave of the atrium cannot be seen because it uh, it is lost somewhere here in in the qrs complex so um if we look at the phases of uh, uh, a cardiac cycle now we start with uh, late diastole, for example. Both uh, sets of chambers, uh, both the atria and the ventricles, are relaxed and ventricles feel passively. And then the uh, sinus node, the sinoatrial node, produces an impulse and then the uh, atria contract to feel the ventricles more to their limits or semi-limits, near limits, so that they are filled with blood fully uh, to contract and push the uh, blood into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And then three at the phase three, we the starting of the um, contraction is called the isovolumic ventricular contraction, which uh, starts to increase the pressure in the ventricles at the isovolumic ventricular contraction, which causes the closure of the atrioventricular valves, namely and on the left side is the mitral valve, and on the right side is the tricuspid valve. So uh, at the isovolumic um, ventricular contraction, the atrioventricular valves are closed. And uh, at this point, the pressure is enough, is enough to close the atrioventricular valves, but not enough to open the ventricular arterial valves from the ventricles to the arteries the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So uh, at, a, at a moment uh, uh, with the isovolumic ventricular contraction, um, the atrioventricular valves and the uh, ventricular arterial, arterial valves are all closed and the chambers, ventricular chambers, are fully filled with blood to be uh, pushed into the great arteries. Now, at ventricular ejection, uh, as contraction carries on, the uh, pressure increase in the ventricles um, pushes the uh, semilunar valves of the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and uh, they open these valves, 
and push the uh, blood uh, that returned to the ventricles from the atria into the aorta and into the pulmonary artery and then we come to the isovolemic ventricular relaxation which uh, all valves again are closed uh, and um, then the, uh, as pressure increases in the atria the ventricle starts to feel passively again and uh, uh, the cycle starts for another time so um, this uh, one contraction of the ventricles uh, and one relaxation of the ventricles this is called a cardiac cycle and um, uh, here the filling of the ventricles and emptying of the ventricles uh, takes place in one cardiac cycle. In short, we can say that a cardiac cycle is a systole and a diastole of the ventricles. So um, if we look at the phases of a cardiac cycle in, in, um, ex as an explanation, we have a systole, which is the period of contraction of the ventricles. We have a diastole, which is equal to the uh, period of relaxation of the ventricles. And we have a cardiac cycle, uh, which is an alternating period of a systole and a diastole, which means that one systole plus one diastole is equal to a one cardiac cycle. So um, at rest, both atria and ventricles in diastole, blood is filling both atria and ventricles due to low pressure conditions. Then comes the atrial diastole after the uh, um, impulse is generated at the sinoatrial node or the SA node. And uh, completes, uh, this completes the ventricular filling. And then uh, isovolumetric ventricular contraction begins which uh, increases the pressure in the ventricles uh, and this causes the atrioventricular valves, the mitral and tricuspid valve, tricuspid valves, to be closed, but it's, the pressure is not enough to open the atrioventricular, uh, my apologies, ventricular arterial uh, valves, which are namely the pulmonary and the aortic valves. And uh, the, as the contraction carries on, the uh, pressure within the ventricles increases more and this pushes the uh, aortic and the pulmonary valves to unload the contents of the ventricles, the right and left ventricles, into the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. And uh, during isovolumetric ventricular contraction, when the uh, uh, mitral and tricuspid valves close almost simultaneously, the first heart sound is produced. If you put a stethoscope over the cardiac, uh, mesocardiac point, then uh, you can hear a um, uh, sound, uh, which refers to the first heart sound. So the arteria go back to diastole and no blood flows, flow as semilunar valves are closed as well. So here we have the same uh, figure again uh, you, um, to, for the ease of following what we say here. So it rests both atria and ventricles in diastole uh, and blood is filling both atria and ventricles due to low pressure conditions because they're all in diastole and the um, um, the pressures within the chambers almost falls to zero millimeter mercury. Then the atrial diastole systole begins uh, which increase the pressure in the uh, uh, atria and this completes uh, pushing the blood into the ventricles well, to complete the ventricular filling. And as a volumetric ventricular contraction starts and closes the valves of the uh, mitral and tricuspid, uh, which are the atrioventricular valves, um, giving rise to the first half sound. And contraction, uh, as contraction in increases, pressure in the ventricles causes the AV valves to close and uh, 
then uh, Atrio go back to diastole and no blood flow as seminular valves are closed as well at this point. So um, this is a cardiac cycle, one systole, one diastole and the phases of a cardiac cycle. So ventricular ejection, ventricular pressure uh, overcomes aortic pressure, seminular valves open, blood is ejected into the aorta and to the pulmonary artery and the nice volumetric ventricular relaxation, interventricular pressure drops below aortic pressure. So seminular valves, these valves go back and close the aortic and pulmonary uh, valves uh, and the second heart sound at that moment like a boom is heard so if you listen to a heart with a stethoscope you can usually hear the opening and uh, the closing of the ventricular uh, atrioventricular valves as a loop and uh, and then the closing of the uh, ventricular arterial valves as a boom so uh, the sound that you, you will hear continuously when you listen to heart with a stethoscope over the chest is something like that. And, and these openings and closings of the valves between the chambers of the heart uh, ensures uh, that the uh, blood is always directed forward, not backward. That is why when we have a valve, valvular problems like insufficiencies of the heart valves, then the uh, sounds that we hear as bloop bloop starts to deteriorate, deteriorate, uh, deteriorate. And depending on which valve is becoming sufficient, we start to lose the heart sounds. For example, if the mitral valves uh, is uh, becoming insufficient, then we hear a that is the um, ejection of blood backwards in, through the mitral valve into the left atrium when the, when the ventricle um, is contracted. So this valve should be closed here, but uh, as the ventricle uh, contracts, because of the insufficiency of the valve, the blood will go back into the left atrium instead of the aorta. Of course, most of it will go into the aorta, but some will go back to the uh, atrium, um, which will cause an enlargement in the left atrium and uh, which will bring a load, uh, volume load to the uh, left atrium. And in the end, which will lead to uh, the uh, uh, enlargement of the left ventricle and bring the patient to a cardiac failure. So um, this is uh, the cycle of, of a heart, uh, which is a systole and diastole, and these are the phases of a cardiac cycle. Uh, so um, these color codings are put here for your uh, better understanding of the, uh, uh, this uh, configuration and the physiology of the heart. So as the last slide here with the uh, color codings here, we have a quick demonstration of all events that uh, happens during a cardiac cycle. For example, as the cardiac cycle goes on, we can record an ECG, uh, the, the contraction of the atria, the contraction of the ventricles, the relaxation of the ventricles. And here, uh, as the atria um, are contracted, the left atrial and left uh, vent uh, right atrial pressure starts to increase, and then comes the ventricular uh, increase and uh, the pressure. Sorry, and this is how the ventricular pressure happens at the systole of the uh, cardiac ventricles, which opens the aortic, this is the blood pressure, which opens the aortic valve and gives us the uh, uh, blood pressure uh, uh, as we, uh, we need uh, to carry on living. So these uh, pressure waves, waves here, intercardiac waves, interaortic waves, and the uh, electrocardiogram of the heart is all correlated with these um, uh, color-coded uh, figures here. So if you can take a look at these, you will understand more how heart works and how pressures are related with the heart cycle and the uh, uh, phases of 
uh, cardiac cycle. We are now moving to the respiratory system functions uh, under the uh, heading of respiratory system physiology. The re respiratory system functions are gas exchange between blood and air, move air to and from exchange surfaces, protect exchange surfaces from environmental variations and pathogens, produce sound and detect olfactory stimuli. For those who are not familiar with what, uh, the olfactory term, there are 12 cranial nerves coming from our brain directly to into the body, and these are doing specific jobs. And olfactory nerves are the first cranial pair of nerves coming out from our brain, they go directly into the nasal area and they're um, responsible from detecting and discriminating the scents. So our nasal area is responsible for detecting the olfactory stimuli. The components of the respiratory systems are system are nose. Uh, starting with the nares, the two openings that extend out of the nose, a nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses, the pharynx, the larynx, trachea, bronchi, lungs, bronchioles and alveoli. And alveoli are the areas where gas exchange happens. If we look at the uh, drawing here, um, the respiratory system uh, starts with the nares, the two openings of our nose, or they're also called the nostrils, uh, into the uh, uh, frontal uh, uh, upper respiratory, this is the upper respiratory tract up to here, and the, uh, we have the nose, we have the nasal cavity here, then we have the nasopharynx area, this is the pharyngeal area, and uh, the portion of the pharynx which is in continuation with the nasal cavity is called the nasopharynx. And then we have the mouth here, and uh, the uh, area of the pharynx which is in continuation with the oral cavity is the oropharynx, and together they, fo they form the uh, pharynx as a total and the nasal cavity and the oral cavity is divided by a, a hard palate and a soft palate. A uh, hard palate is a bone and soft palate is a connective tissue um, and then we have the laryngeal area, the laryngopharynx which is the portion of the pharynx in uh, contact with the uh, pharynx of, of the, uh, um, sorry, the larynx of the respiratory system. Now here there is something uh, called the epiglottis and this area is called the glottis area. As we try to swallow something and here goes the, the pharynx, the uh, complete pharynx, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx is in continuation with the oesophagus and oesophagus is the uh, structure that takes the, our food or what we drink to our uh, stomach. Uh, so they're opposite to each other, larynx being the trachea being in front and the uh, oesophagus being at the back. So when we try to swallow something while we're breathing, the um, the uh, glottis region of the trachea moves outward and the epiglottis comes and closes the uh, uh, the opening of the uh, trachea like a check valve so that anything that we're swallowing does not go into the trachea and is rooted into the oesophagus uh, to, to be uh, swallowed into our stomach. So um, the uh, the, this uh, area until the uh, 
nasal is the laryngopharynx area this is the laryngopharynx pharyngeal area here uh, is called the upper respiratory tract and starting with the trachea the larynx and the trachea and then the lungs to the uh, uh, air sacs which are called the alveoli um, the the rest is called the lower respiratory tract um, the respiratory tract itself has two uh, um, portions uh, the first part is the conduction portion which conduct the air movement and from nares to small bronchioles and it has the respiratory portion uh, which is responsible from the uh, gas ex gas exchange so the, in the respiratory portion there is a gas exchange region and respiratory bronchioles and alveoli if we start with the nose the external nares the nostrils admit air and nasal uh, vestibule lined with hairs to filter air the vestibule opens into nasal cavity and heart palate separates nasal and oral cavities. The cavity continues through internal nares to nasopharynx. So remember the figure that I showed you, the upper part uh, is of the pharynx is in continuation with the nasopharynx and that na nasal cavity. The middle part is con in continuation with the oral cavity and the bottom part is in continuation with the laryngopharynx, laryngeal area. So as a whole, pharynx is divided into three portions, nasal, oral and uh, laryngopharyngeal places and as a whole it's called the pharynx. Uh, self palate underlines nasopharynx and respira respiratory epithelium lines the airways. Now, respiratory epithelium is a special kind of epithelium. As you know, we have epithelium, epithelial cells everywhere. But the respiratory um, uh, epithelium is uh, of a kind of um, different importance. And uh, the thing is that uh, they produced mucus and always keeps our uh, respiratory tract uh, wet. Uh, it protects our respiratory tract to dry out. Now, if we have a sagittal um, cross section of the uh, uh, our head through the middle of the uh, nose and mouth, here we can see um, and take a closer look at the nose. Here are the nares with the cilia uh, standing at the. Uh, close to entrance point of the nares and there the, they form the first protection side of of the air intake and then we have the nasal conchae the nasal conchae are um, structures that uh, the, when air is taken inside it gets turbulent turbulent it makes a turbulence uh, in the vicinity of these uh, conchae and with this turbulence the air is uh, heated before it is directed to our trachea uh, to protect our um, um, respiratory trachea and lungs from extreme colds etc. And then the, the uh, nasal cavity is in continuation with the uh, pharynx area so this area is called the nasopharynx and as you can see the uh, nasal cavity is divided from the oral cavity this is the tongue this is the mouth teeth lips um, the oral cavity is di uh, divided by a heart palate in the front and as goes back to the uh, back of the pharynx um, this bit softens and makes the uvula uh, or it is sometimes named as the smaller tongue so um, the oral oropharynx and the nasopharynx come into a continuation at the back of the oral cavity and the nasal cavity and this continues towards the larynx region before the oesophagus or the uh, food carrying tube starts it goes towards the, the laryngeal region 
and it's called the laryngopharynx here. So laryngopharynx and the uh, oropharynx and the nasopharynx, they all constitute the pharyngeal area that we uh, call as, as a whole the pharynx. The respiratory epithelium plus the supporting connective tissue with mucous glands lines all nasal cavity and most of airways. Uh, the goblet cells, the, this is a, a special name for the uh, mucus, secreting, uh, mucus secreting cells, the goblet cells and gland cells secrete mucus and mucus traps inhaled dirt, pathogens, etc and ciliated cells sweep the mucus out of the airways into the pharynx so that we swallow them. Or when we cough, we uh, spit them out. Uh, irritants, uh, when, when met with irritants, uh, the uh, secretion is stimulated more and we get a runny nose. So here is a um, drawing of uh, the uh, epithelium of uh, the respiratory tract that lines all the trachea and branchials and uh, inside of the respiratory tract. Uh, this is the basal uh, lamina propria and then we have uh, the uh, stem cells, the small stem cells and we have the ciliated cells at the end of which we have the ciliae and we have the goblet cells filled with mucus they secrete the mucus into the uh, lining of the uh, epithelial cells that trap the uh, foreign materials, the pathogens, etc. And the CDA moves the mucus always uh, upwards towards the pharynx. And this is a microscopic view of the same drawing. You can see that there are stem cells around uh, which form, this is the uh, lamina propria. And these are the goblet cells full, full uh, with mucus. And here you can see the CDA, uh, which are to push uh, the uh, uh, mucus uh, towards the pharynx to be uh, swallowed, uh, swallowed or to be uh, uh, speeded out. And here is an electronic uh, elect um, electron microscopic view of the uh, uh, bronchial uh, epithelium and you can see here that we have the white blood cells we have the cilia of the uh, uh, cells of the lining of the cells for the uh, uh, epithelium and we have the entrapped um, foreign materials the microbes etc Uh, if we look at the anatomy of pharynx or the throat, uh, it is divided into three main parts. As I have told you, the nasopharynx, area related with the nose, the oropharynx, it's the area related with the mouth, and the laryngopharynx is the area related with the larynx, and all three uh, forms the complete pharynx in our body. And uh, we have seen these that. Uh, um, here is the epiglottis, here is the glottis region, and when you try to swallow, when you take something ingested in your mouth and you push it to the uh, oropharynx and it starts to drop into the, towards the esophagus, if this epiglottis is, is kept open, then there is a great uh, chance that the uh, swallowed, uh, swallowed uh, material passes into the trachea and goes into our lungs, which is unacceptable, so it blocks the uh, our air passage and causes uh, reactions that uh, the body has to uh, give response to and makes uh, a very serious um, uh, inflammatory response, which in turn gives rise to infections and uh, that might even uh, lead to death of people. So um, when we ingest something into our mouth, it goes down the pharynx, and as it passes through and gets through the laryngo 
pharynx towards the esophagus here. This epiglottis as a check valve, it comes and uh, closes the entrance of the uh, um, uh, trachea so that the uh, um, nutrient is or water, whatever we're ingesting, is directed to uh, the esophagus and then it reopens again for us to continue to breathe. The, uh, these areas as a whole constitute the upper respiratory tract, as I told you before, uh, or our respiratory anatomy, and from the laryngopharynx downwards is named as the lower respiratory tract and starts with the larynx. The larynx is also called the voice box. It is made of nine cartilages, and cartilages as are those tissues found usually at the end of the bones. Uh, they are not as tough as bones. Uh, they uh, form some cushioning for the uh, uh, joints, especially uh, to f make them work flawlessly. Uh, air passes through the glottis. I will show you the uh, drawing of this. It is covered by epiglottis during swallowing. It keeps solids, liquids out of airways. It is made of elastic cartilage. It supports two vocal cords so that we can speak and uh, the mechanism of speaking is we intake our breath uh, actively and as we passively uh, exhale, we use our um, vocal cord muscles to produce uh, sound. Now here is an endoscopic view of the uh, um, larynx. Um, this is the epiglottis. This epiglottis acts as a check, check valve and uh, there is uh, the esophagus behind this and uh, when, when we uh, are to, uh, sorry, the esophagus is at, at this side, um, the, when we try to uh, swallow something, this epiglottis just falls onto this and this comes outward and uh, the entry of the tracheal system, respiratory system, is closed by the epiglottis. And the uh, sw uh, swallowed uh, material go is directed to the esophagus. And then we have these corniculate uh, cartilages, we have the false uh, vocal cords, and then we have the true vocal cords here. And as we uh, talk, these move sideways and vibrate so that they produce sound. If we look at the anatomy of the larynx and trachea, the trachea it is also called the windpipe because the uh, it's the basic area where um, uh, the in inhaled air passes to reach to the lungs. Uh, stiffened by C-shaped it is stiffened by C-shaped uh, cartilage rings. Esophagus stuck to posterior surface of the trachea and cartilage is missing at that contact point. So trachea is distorted by balls of food as they pass down the esophagus to the stomach. And uh, what I mean here is that if we have a cross-sectional uh, cut from here, you can see and look from the above, you can see that the uh, trachea is made of C-shaped cartilages and you can see the muc uh, endothelium, lining endothelium of the trachea. And the, uh, the uh, back side of the uh, cartilages is made of uh, muscles and connective tissue and behind it there is the esophagus and as food passes through this uh, from here to the stomach this area is always distorted by the passing food so uh, the trachea is not a fully circular uh, uh, cartilages tissue uh, it's a c-shaped cartilages tissue the bronchi, which is the plural of bronchus, uh, are the main first divided uh, parts of the uh, trachea, trachea. 
and there are two main bronchi, two branches, as the right and left primary bronchi. Primary bronchi branch farther, uh, further and form the secondary bronchi, and each ventilates a lobe of the lungs, and there are five lobes in lungs, three of them at the right side, the right lung, and two of them at the left lung. And uh, secondary bronchi then branch and form the tertiary bronchi. And tertiary bronchi branch repeatedly to form the bronchiole, bronchioli. Uh, a bronchioli, a bronchus, bronchus is, is a singular, and bronchioli are the plural. And as bronchi becomes uh, smaller, cartilage ratio decreases, and smooth muscle increases in their structure. The bronchioli, uh, they, the cartilage absent at this level. The diameter of bronchi bronchioles, uh, bronchioli is uh, less than one millimeter. The terminal bronchioli deliver air to a single lobule. Uh, smooth muscle in the walls of bronchioles, bronchioli are uh, uh, controlled by autonomous nervous system. And sympathetic system dominancy, at, during the sympathetic system dominancy, uh, the bronchodilation is caused. And when parasympathetic system is active uh, or dominates, uh, the, there is a bronco, bronchoconstriction. Uh, excess bronchoconstriction leads to a chronic disease called asthma. In this figure here, you can see the uh, trachea coming down and dividing into two main bronchi, the right and the left bronchi. And the uh, left bronchi is divided into uh, secondary uh, bronchus. The secondary bronchus each uh, go to a lobe of, of the uh, uh, lungs. Uh, for the left, there are two and for the right there are three uh, secondary uh, bronchi, bronchi and by then these secondary developed into smaller bronchi called the tertiary bronchi and then more smaller bronchi and then to bronchioles and the bronchioles enter into terminal bronchioles and they enter into the respiratory bronchial and these go into the uh, alveoli in a pulmonary lobule. If we look at the alveolar ducts and the alveoli, the alveoli, the alveoli is the plural alveolus. Its single um, uh, sac is called an alveolus. So the alveoli are the is the plural of an alveolus. The alveoli are the gas exchange regions of the lungs. Respiratory bronchioles lead into alveolar ducts. Alveolar ducts lead into alveolar sacs and sacs are clusters of interconnected alveoli. They give lungs an open, spongy look, and there are about 150 million alveoli per lung, which makes it 300 million alveoli for two lungs. Now here we can see the uh, bronchial uh, dividing into um, as it loses its cartilage it is more, more covered with the smooth muscle around so the smooth muscles are under the control of the autonomous nervous system which uh, uh, is comprised the uh, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system and as, as the sympathetic system dominates these bronchioles uh, open uh, for more air to pass because it prepares you, as I've told you in the previous lessons, it prepares you uh, for a fight or a flight. Uh, and uh, if the parasympathetic system is uh, dom dominating, these bronchioles become smaller because you don't need do so much uh, respiration at that time. You're in a resting uh, situation, etc. So um, the, uh, the terminal uh, bronchioles enter into the uh, sacs. These, each sac here is called an alveolus, and when there are too many like this, they are called the alveoli, and each alveoli is covered by a, a rete of uh, um, blood vessel capillaries where um, the um, hypo-oxygenated blood comes into the uh, 
surrounding of these alveoli to lose their carbon dioxide, to give the carbon dioxide inside to the uh, alveolar sacs and extract the oxygens which is present inside the sacs so that as they leave the capillaries, they're oxygenated and uh, they go to the left atrium, to the left ventricle and to the uh, body to uh, supply the needs of the body with oxygen and they uh, give away from here and then we the the given away carbon dioxide which are now in the alveolar sacs are exhaled through the body to the environment now as for the uh, respiratory physiology uh, there are three integrated processes for the respiration function the first one is the pulmonary ventilation which is the moving air into and out of the respiratory tract and that we call the breathing. Uh, there is a gas exchange uh, function. Uh, this is the diffusion between the alveoli and circulating blood and between the blood and interstitial fluids. And there is a gas transport part, which is the movement of oxygen from alveoli to cells and carbon dioxide from cells to alveoli. Um, the pulmonary ventilation, uh, in a single breath, um, this uh, a breath is, consists of an inspiration and an expiration. So we make an inhalation and then we make an exhalation. And this is uh, what we call a single breath. While under normal conditions, inspiration is an energy consuming action where all our respiratory muscles like the diaphragm, intercostal muscles, contract for the air intake. On the other hand, the expiration phase of respiration is a passive process. So, um, of course, this is uh, not to be forgotten that it's under normal con conditions. The expiration phase uh, is a passive process because once we uh, consume energy and contract our um, um, respiration muscles, mainly the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, our chest moves forward and upward. And when it's, it goes up uh, and if we cease to uh, in, uh, uh, inspirate, then passively this chest has to come back to its place. And while doing so, uh, it diminishes the intrathoracic size and the uh, lungs starts to clop and uh, uh, move out the uh, inhaled um, uh, air. So under forced conditions, however, where larger volumes of air is inhaled, then expiration also becomes active. So we inhale and we exhale. But to exhale more, we give out everything, and uh, uh, this is a forced process as well. Uh, the rate of respiration is, is the number of breaths inhaled and exhaled within a minute, and is expressed as breaths per minute. So normal breath rate in adults is, is between 12 and 18 breaths, breaths per minute, a normal breath rate in children is 18 to 24 um, minutes per min uh, breath per minute. Um, these numbers are very, very important because uh, in order to uh, say that the uh, breathing of the patient is uh, of, of a person is uh, normal or pathologic, the normal values has to be known. When we look at the gas transport, arterial blood entering peripheral capillaries delivers oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. Gas reactions with blood are completely reversible. In general, a small change in plasma partial oxygen pressure causes a large change in how much oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin binds most of the oxygen in the bloodstream and as you all know, uh, hemoglobin is the uh, hem protein and sorry the hem part of the uh, uh, intracellular uh, in the intracellular area of uh, the uh, uh, red blood cell which contains iron 
and the globulin is the uh, protein that is bound to him portion together it is called the hemoglobin and this takes place in the uh, uh, red blood cells and the uh, iron uh, which has uh, positive uh, ions uh, binds the oxygen to hemoglobin so if the partial oxygen pressure in plasma increases hemoglobin binds more oxygen and if partial oxygen uh, pressure decreases hemoglobin releases oxygen at a given partial oxygen pressure hemoglobin will release additional oxygen if the ph falls uh, rather to say to shifts to acidic side or the temperature rises um, in fact, uh, the regulation of breath is not uh, done with the uh, content of the uh, oxygen in the bloodstream, but rather with carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is more dangerous than the oxygen. The aerobic metabolism, the metabolism that takes uh, in our body in the presence of oxygen, produces carbon dioxide and 7% of the produced carbon dioxide travels in the blood uh, in the plasma of the blood as dissolved gas and the 23% travels bound to the hemoglobin uh, then uh, as carbon dioxide is bound to the hemoglobin it is called carbaminohemoglobin so uh, on the arterial side we have the oxygenated hemoglobin and the uh, venous side of our circulation. Uh, we ha mainly have carbaminohemoglobin and 70% of carbon dioxide, which is very, very important here, is converted to carbonic acid in red blood cells. And that is how carbon dioxide is mainly transported within our body once they're produced by the cells uh, as, as a waste product. So um, catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase, uh, this dissociates into hydrogen atom and bicarbonate, carbonate, uh, and carbonate enters plasma from red blood cells. So there's here is a, a schematic drawing uh, for for the uh, uh, transport of uh, carbon dioxide in the blood. So seven percent remains dissolved in the plasma, and this is an erythrocyte, the red uh, somatic uh, red blood cell. Carbon dioxide diffuses into bloodstream. Uh, seven percent remains dissolved in the plasma, and ninety three percent diffuse into the red blood cell. And 23% binds to hemoglobin, forming carbaminohemoglobin. And 70% uh, is converted to carbonic uh, acid, which is why the activity of carbonic anhydrase uh, goes to um, uh, hydrogen ions and uh, carbonate. And carbonate gets into the uh, uh, plasma from the uh, red blood cell and uh, hydrogen is uh, removed by buffers, especially hemoglobin. And as you know, hydrogen, uh, if it becomes excess in the blood, it causes the blood pH to move to the acidic side, hence giving our uh, body uh, and plasma an acidic medium character. Um, so carbon dioxide transport um, primarily travels in the bloodstream as bicarbonate ions, uh, carbonate ions, uh, which form through dissociation of the carbonic acid produced by carbonic anhydrase inside the red blood cells. So lesser amounts of carbon dioxide are bound to hemoglobin or dissolved in plasma. So if we look at the basic control of respiration uh, uh, in our body, uh, we uh, during the quiet breathing at rest, we, maybe we should say for that, uh, the uh, inhalation taking in uh, the uh, air takes around two seconds and exhalation giving out the uh, uh, inhaled air 
um, because it's a uh, passive process, it takes around um, three seconds. So the uh, whole process of uh, inhaling and exhaling or uh, one breath um, is around a five second process. So um, the uh, inspiratory muscles contract, inspiration occurs, dorsal inspiratory group is inhibited at this time, and then inspiratory muscles relax, passive expiration occurs, and dorsal respiratory group becomes active again to start to uh, inspiratory um, process. If we look at the reflex control of respiration, uh, inflation reflex, uh, it protects lungs from overexpansion. We have a deflation reflex that st uh, stimulates inspiration when lungs collapse. And we, ha we, have a chemoreceptor, we have chemoreceptor reflexes that respond to changes in pH uh, and uh, partial oxygen pressure, partial carbon dioxide pressure in blood and cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that traverses uh, around the, uh, uh, between the uh, central nervous system, within the central nervous system. So uh, if we look at the, to the control by higher centers of respiration, those were the reflexes, and we have uh, more higher centers for uh, respiration control, uh, some stimuli exert effects on pons or on respiratory motor neurons. Uh, these, these may be uh, voluntary actions like the speech or singing uh, or shouting out. Um, and there may be some involuntary actions through the limbic system like rage, uh, eating or sexual arousal. So interplay between the respiratory centers in the pons and medulla oblongata sets the basic pace of breathe, breathing as modified by input from chemoreceptors, baroreceptors and stretch receptors. Carbon dioxide level rather than oxygen level is the main driver for breathing. Protective reflexes can interrupt breathing and conscious control of respiratory muscles can act as well. Now, the higher areas uh, for the um, respiration control are the uh, cerebral cortex, the limbic system, and hypothalamus in the brain. And this is the cerebellum, uh, this is the uh, pons, uh, this is the medulla area of the uh, uh, brain stem. So, uh, respiration is mainly, mainly controlled, uh, of course, by uh, we have cerebral stimuluses uh, like speech and uh, singing, etc. But the uh, main control of the uh, uh, respiration is at the brain stem, uh, which includes the uh, medulla oblongata and the, the, uh, the pons uh, of, of the uh, brain stem. So, uh, functional, uh, there are some functional relationships between the uh, respiratory system and uh, other systems. Uh, we uh, all are all our bodies in in uh, in a way in contact with the uh, uh, respiratory system. So if we look at the integumentary system, as you will remember, the integumentary system consists of our um, skin, hair, sweat glands, etc. Uh, the integumentary system protects uh, portions of upper respiratory tract, like uh, the hair guard at the entry of the nares. The nasal mucus also acts as a barrier for further protection to lower respiratory tract. Uh, we have the skeletal system. Uh, move, movements of ribs uh, are the important uh, areas for breathing. As I have told you, the uh, movement of chest uh, to upwards and forward increases the thoracic uh, capacity, hence uh, pulling the uh, um, lungs with it, and then air enters into the lungs 
uh, uh, with the movement of the uh, ribs. And the skeleton also sets the limits for lung expansion mechanically to prevent overinflation. So uh, they move to a certain limit and uh, the, uh, once they come to the limit uh, they can uh, pro provide some protection for the lungs not to be uh, overinflated. The muscular system activity generates carbon dioxide, that's the uh, connection with the uh, respiratory system, and respiratory muscles fill and empty lungs, other muscles uh, and other muscles control entrances to respiratory tract. So intrinsic laryngeal muscles control airflow through the lungs and produce sounds. So the, the peripheral muscles uh, for our living, for our movement, locomotion, they produce carbon dioxide, and it's the, uh, uh, the respiratory muscles that help uh, exhaling or removing the uh, waste product, the carbon dioxide, out of the body through our lungs uh, by giving movement to the uh, thoracic region. Uh, if we look at the nervous system, uh, the, the nervous system monitors respiratory volume and blood gas levels, controls pace and depth of respiration, and this is mainly done at the uh, limbic system and the uh, um, brainstem area of the brain uh, in the pons and medulla oblongata. And carbon dioxide here is the major component that is constantly monitored by the nervous system for the regulation of respiration. So if carbon dioxide level uh, is to uh, increase in the bloodstream, uh, this is sensed by the uh, brainstem and it orders the lungs to uh, breathe faster and breathe deeper in order to remove uh, carbon dioxide more and more from our body. Uh, the endocrine system uh, is uh, under the control of the nervous system and epinephrine and norepinephrine stimulate the respiratory activity and dilate respiratory passageways. So uh, as you will remember, the epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, that we have seen in the uh, uh, nervous system are uh, under the uh, control of the sympathetic autonomic uh, nervous system. So when the sympathetic system dominates and uh, gives out epinephrine or norepinephrine, uh, the number of breaths per minute is also increased and the uh, bronchioles are dilated for more air to be ingested inside. The cardiovascular system and the relation uh, of uh, uh, respiration. The red blood cells transport oxygen and carbon dioxide and uh, between lungs and peripheral tissue. So uh, it is the um, major uh, system that uh, carries the uh, needs of the cells towards the cells. The needs of the cells is apparently oxygen here. And it is the, uh, uh, again, the circulation uh, cardiovascular system that carries away the uh, waste product of the uh, cells, uh, mainly uh, the carbon dioxide. So the bicarbonate ions contribute to buffering capability of blood. Uh, the re relation of uh, lymphatic uh, system with the respiratory system is that the tonsils uh, in the pharyngeal system uh, and oropharynx and uh, nasopharyngeal systems protect against infection and entrance uh, to the respiratory tract. Lymphatic vessels monitor lymph drainage from lungs and mobilize specific defenses when infection occurs. And alveolar phagocytes present uh, antigens to trigger specific defenses mucous membrane uh, lining the nasal cavity and upper pharynx traps pathogens protects deeper tissues. The relation of the digestive system with the respiration system is, is that the, it provides substrates, vitamins, water and ions that are necessary to all cells of the respiratory system. Uh, increased thoracic and abdominal pressure through contraction of respiratory and muscles can assist in defecation. The urinary system's relation is that uh, it eliminates organic wastes generated by cells of the respiratory system, maintains normal fluid and ion balance in the blood, 
and this acid is in the regulation of pH by eliminating carbon dioxide in the form of carbonates. And the reproductory system relation is that uh, the, we can uh, we get uh, respiratory uh, ch rate changes and depth uh, while uh, during a sexual arousal and intercourse.